Okay, so this is the fourth lecture on the topic of memory. Um, in the last one, we were talking about long-term memory. And in this lecture, I want to talk about retrieval. And yeah, I want to talk about retrieval. Okay, so a couple, so remember going back to chapter the first lecture, memory is associated with these three processes. We have um, encoding and storage and then retrieval. And some, there's a, an important concept here called what's, what's called retrieval cues. And retrieval cues are the things that help us remember. So there's a really important strategy about retrieval cues though, is that in order for them to work, they have to make sense, right? So there are some examples of retrieval cues or the things that help us remember, right? So you've got the old, back in the olden days, they tie a string around your finger and that was supposed to help you remember something or there might be things called, um, oh, what are they called? Oh, see here, I have to go, there are letters and you put them together. See, I'm using the semantic memory model, right? Um, so here's one is every good boy does fine. And if you're a musician, you might remember that as those were the letters of the trouble treble clef, right, or face, right, and those were the letters of the, also the spaces, and that's how you could remember notes. I remember that from the sixth grade, right, um, and I'm, I'm not a musician, and I don't really read music anymore, I mean, I kind of, anyway, but, and then you have, um, let's see, there's my Aunt Sally, what's that one, my Aunt Sally, there's some for PINDOS, I believe that refers to parentheses, M um, refers to algebra and see if we were together you could remind me what all of these remember what all of these refer to never eat soggy waffles right that's north south east and west those are all memory retrieval cues uh, notes you leave yourself a little note I like to write little things right here on my hand those are memory retrieval cues um, some other ways to think about them you've got something called the tip of your tongue right and a tip of your tongue so you remember back in chapter two and you watched the video with Randy and his inability he had the Wernicke's or the Barocca I think he had the Barocca aphasia where he couldn't get words out and it was like he was really struggling with this tip of your tongue right it's just this partial recall and it's right there and then maybe you walk away and you go in the other room oh and you remember so here's a good example of a memory retrieval cue oops i forgot to set my timer um and that is you um you get it you're on the couch and you need to get a pair of scissors and you walk into the kitchen oh, i forgot why you came here and then you go back to the couch and now you remember right because the couch itself or maybe whatever you're doing that's the memory retrieval cue i've heard people call this like the doorway effect like you walk through a doorway and it resets your memory no that's that's not really what it is but spaces can be like a memory retrieval cue they can be smells they can be sounds um I remember when my father was sick, when he was dying, I had to switch like the grocery stores I went to because I used it, the grocery store I went to had an odor, had a smell, and it always made me very sad, right? Well, that's the thing about your senses is your sense of smell has a more ancient it has a its memory is actually better than some of your other senses and part of that i think we said in the second chapter too is that your olfactory bulb the part your where it processes smell sits right next to your hippocampus and so there's the those memories are in fact better right um, those are all act as memory retrieval cues or colors or sounds um, all those um, in this, after this lecture, you'll find an exercise that I call free recall versus recognition. And um, it, it is intended, so, so there's different kinds of cued recall. So free recall would be like essay questions. Uh, cued recall is like fill in the blank. Um, sometimes if, you know, if I'm writing an essay question, I might sort of what I call prime the pump. And that is, so in class, in class discussion, we talked about, or when I say remember, remember going back to chapter two, we had the conversation about brain structures, and and then you go, oh yeah, I remember. So that's kind of what a cued recall, a free recall, which I think is actually kind of a better test. I mean, if I get if I ran the world, all questions would be essay. You know, it's like so tell me everything you know about memory, right? We're like what? What are you talking about? But 
if I prepare you by cueing you, by getting you into the right box, right, in that place where you stored all of your memories about the chapter on memory, then I increase the odds that you're going to find what I'm looking for. All right, so you know it's in the, the you know it's in the closet in the hallway. You just don't know exactly where in the closet in the hallway. Well, that's a whole lot easier than to say I don't know. It's in my house somewhere, right? At least I have a better chance of finding it if I know what closet I sort things out. Which you know you do probably do that, right? You have certain closets designated to keep certain things. Um, think about your brain like that too. Uh, so recognition is multiple choice. I don't like multiple choice. And sadly, in this world uh, where we take so many, do so much online, I kind of have to use a lot of multiple choice. Um, but, you know, some folks actually call multiple choice multiple guess because it doesn't really measure what you know. What it measures is what you recognize. And I guess it would depend on what the purpose of why do I need to know that? Am I ever going to need to recall that information just at random? You know, maybe if I'm going on Jeopardy or something, I'm going to want to be able to pull it out of, you know, the deep recesses of my brain. But if life is mostly about knowing if that's right or if that's wrong, then recognition is fine. And then you have serial position effects. So I asked you about this earlier in a previous slide, you know, the 12 days of Christmas, right? So serial position, and this shows up again, right? Over and over. And this is, I think this is really practical to think about. Like my mom, my daughter was telling me that her boyfriend was going for an interview and he wanted to go like in the middle. And she's like, no, don't go in the middle, right? Go in the beginning or the end. This is like, you know, real life stuff that if you really want people to remember you, remember we talked about making good first impressions. Well, the best first impression is to be the first first impression, right? Don't be the middle first impression or be the last thing that they remember. Restaurants do this, right? Restaurants will do this too, um, that they will, oh, phew, I just forgot how, what the example. Um, oh, no, no, concerts. Like I used to go to a lot of concerts before the pandemic and, you know, performers often open the show with some of their best stuff, right? The, the most famous tunes and they end their show with some of the best tunes. They put all the crap in the middle because you're going to remember what they opened with and you're going to remember how you felt when you left. Right, so that's serial position effect. Those are gonna be the, re the memories that are longest. And you may not even remember, you know, what they played right before intermission. Um, retailers do this too. I had a student in my class many years ago who was a, uh, what's it called? He was a, he worked for like a, a, a car dealership where they fixed it, the maintenance stuff, right? The Toyota, whatever it was. And he, he said that in their business, they were taught money in the middle. So you talk about the problems. I don't actually know what he put in the beginning or the end, but you always put the money in the middle, how much it was going to cost because people were less, they would leave feeling less bad if they didn't leave. The last thing they thought about wasn't how much it were going to cost them. Right. And sometimes the, the last experience can be remembered more than the first experience. So serial, that's what that serial position effect. Encoding specificity principle. This is a really good point. This is a really important concept. But what this says is you're, you're going to remember things better if you, well, there's a couple different encoding specificity pr principles, but it's the idea that how I encode information is going to influence how, how I am able to retrieve it. So one example or of the coding specificity principle says that, so the specific, um, the specific way that I encode is what specific coding, okay. So the environment in which I encode information is going to influence, or I should say the environment in which I try to retrieve information is going to influence how well I retrieve it. In other words, I am more likely to remember an event or to remember something if I am in the same context when I go to recall it that I was when I encoded it. Um, a more simple way to say is that if I want to do perform well on a test, I need to encode that information in the same classroom in which I retrieve that information because places act like retrieval cues, contexts, 
act like retrieval cues. I go to the kitchen, I can't remember, I want my scissors. I come back, oh, the context of being in the living room is where I've formed this memory. And so when I come back to that context, I will be able to retrieve that memory. So the best way to remember something is to, to, pro, to, is to encode it and retrieve it in the same context, right? You know, these are the great examples of, oh, I saw something on Facebook the other day, some of my high school friends, and they're like, oh, yeah, I went back to that restaurant and high school memories just came flooding back because they were in the context in which they formed them. So places, sounds, colors, uh, people can act as and memory retrieval cues. And this is, oh, it's on another, it's on another slide, but this phenomena of deja vu, like when you're in a space and you go, oh, I've been here before. The theory is, there's a couple theories about what deja vu is, but, but that is, a one theory is that it's actually a context. So you're in an antique store and like, man, I swear I've been here before, you know, and, it may not, you, you probably were not there before, or I have a memory, I've been here, but perhaps there is something in that context. The thought is, is that there's something in that context, in that, in that antique store, that maybe reminded you of your grandmother. And your grandmother is a very familiar feeling. So you see this, this lamp, it triggers familiar sensations, and you interpret that sensation as, oh, I've been here before you really have it. You're just experiencing that familiar. Also interesting about deja vu is that uh, as you get older, you have less and less of it, right? Which is a bummer because I always used to kind of like it. Um, there's another theory that says that what deja vu is, is it's like one hemisphere is processing an information before the other one does. So like for one, one hemisphere, it's a memory, but it's new for the other. And so there's this sort of sense of being familiar, right? That, that you experience deja vu. Um, but anyway, uh, and then a couple other encoding specificity principles. Oh, this is a really important one too. Mood congruence, mood congruence. There will be a question about mood congruence. And I keep pointing over here because I have my slide show up. Um, but mood congruence is that your mood is a context cue. Your mood is a retrieval cue. That when I am in a good mood, I remember good memories. When I am in a bad mood, I remember bad memories. Well, we all know that, right? We've all had this experience, but this is one explanation for what happens uh, when we're depressed and when we ruminate, that we start to think about uh, sad memories, right? And the, our sad memories call, recalls other sad memories and it recalls other sad memories. And I stay sad because all I can remember are sad memories because it's the emotional state itself that acts as a retrieval cue. This is also why people say, oh, I don't think about that right now. I don't think about that right now. Because we intuitively know that if I start thinking about memories like that, I'm going to think about more memories like that. I'm going to stay in that mood because our memories are a mood congruence. So, you know, like your, uh, your significant other forgot your birthday. Oh my gosh, my significant other forgot my anniversary. Oh my gosh, my significant other forgot Chris. Oh my gosh, my significant other's a jerk, right? On the other hand, you know, he brought me coffee this morning. You know, he brings me coffee a lot. You know, he also brings me ice cream. You know, he's just a really great guy, right? So how we can just stay mood congruent. Things are congruent. Uh, and our mood will act as a memory retrieval cue. The last one, uh, these, these just get longer and longer, don't they? Uh, the last thing I wanna say about retrieval is what's called flashbulb memories. And this was also an exam question, uh, what are flashbulb memories? So flashbulb memories are usually associated with some sort of strong emotion or a significant event, right? Um, so like, common ones. Uh, where were you uh, when the towers fell? Uh, you know, when you're old enough, where were you when Kennedy was shot? Or where were you when the Challenger exploded? Or tell me about, you know, oh my gosh, here's one that I have more recently was when Riley County got its first COVID case, right? And I was at work and people's phones all over the place. I was working retail and phones all over the place started going off, like there was this alarm. Well, the county had set up, you know, it was a, it was a 
it was a county alert, county wide. So anybody that had that on their phone, their phone started buzzing. And I still can tell you, I have a memory. Here's the thing about memories, because your memories are mostly wrong. It's, I don't say I remember. What I say is I have a memory of, because that's more accurate. The memories that we have may not be reliable, but I do have a memory of standing in the back of a store, sort of looking around like, what the hell is going on, right? Now, I don't think that's actually true. Uh, so what flashbulb memories are when we, they feel, they feel so clear and they're not any more clear than any other memory. What's different about flashbulb memories is we're sure they're right. Like I can tell you what I was wearing. I can tell you where I was standing. But here's the fun thing to do with flashbulb memories you might have is check them out. See if you can confirm them right? Uh, think about, so here's, here's the one I typically use as an, an example to illustrate this point was 9-11, right? It was a Tuesday and I was walking, this is the memory I have. I was walking my son to school and I was standing at the corner of Juliet and, uh, Juliet and uh, points when I learned the second tower fell. I have that memory in my head. And it was, and my son was wearing khaki pants. He was going to Catholic school. He was wearing khaki pants and a polo shirt. That's the memory I have. It, it is completely impossible. First of all, he only wore his khaki pants on Friday and it was a Tuesday and I can confirm that it was a Tuesday. Second of all, we only had one cell phone in my house at the time and I probably, and I would not have taken it with me. I would not have walked with me. Third of all, um, the towers fell about nine o'clock in the morning and William had to be at school by 745. So I would not be standing two blocks from the school at that time. He would have been really, really late. And so it's completely impossible, but that's the memory I have, right? And the, another, and the other thing about what happens with memories is when you take them out, I take, so this is also coding specificity principle. When I take memories out and I tell them, I distort them every time I tell that memory because I'm telling a story, I'm seeing it in my head, I'm recalling all of the events, but now I have a new memory of that memory and it includes this context, what I've just told, right? And so I put that memory away and it's distorted. So every time I take it out, I use the example of board games. We, in my house, we don't play board games except on the holidays, right? Christmas, New Year's, that's it. So much time we play board games. And for the last 20 years, I've had a big dog. I've had a big dog, the shits. I mean, different dogs, three dogs. But so when I put my board game away back in, you know, 2000, it was put away and it had maybe um, Pep, Pep's dog hair in it because dog hair is everywhere. Well, two years, and the next year I take it back out. Pep's now dead. And I now have Pete. Well, this year when I put the game away, Pete's dog hair was in there too. So now I have Pep and Pete's dog hair. And our memories are kind of like that. Every time we bring them out, we expose them to distortion and we put them away or we bring them out the next year and they're even more distorted, right? So our memories are notoriously and they're so easy to, to mess up. I mean, so another example that, um, it, that I will also, that you can find over in your canvas shell is uh, what, what do I what am I calling it? It's the false memory exercise, and it just illustrates um, how easy it is to distort your memories. So I'm going to wrap this up here, and when we come back. We'll talk more about imperfect memories.